Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth clip of this week's lecture on reflexivity and feminism, in which I want to um, really move uh, to kind of characterize a little bit more deeply and more in more detail that crucial kind of turning point in anthropology in the 1980s that we associate with that term reflexivity and which, uh, as I um, began to explain in the previous clip, uh, in many ways has its root uh, uh, in the kind of awakening uh, of the question of positionality through feminist uh, uh, anthropology in the 1970s, as well as, as we'll see more clearly next week, post-colonial kind of movements within anthropology as well. So I just want to kind of really take you into that story uh, of the crisis of representation that I mentioned in an earlier clip that came to tag what happened to anthropology particularly in the United States um, in the 1980s. I, I do want to kind of draw attention to the fact that um, a lot of these uh, movements were only felt in Europe in the 90s, actually, when I was a student. Um, a lot of British and French uh, anthropologists, and those are the two kind of big uh, traditions of anthropology in Europe. Uh, you could arguably, arguably say that there are more Belgium, France and many other countries now in Europe, of course, to anthropology, but these traditional kind of um, homes of this kind of originally colonial project, of course, of anthropology are Britain and France and continue to be kind of very central to European anthropology. Um, they were kind of sceptical and kept at a certain distance from these developments that I'm talking about. And they only really percolated into uh, our work um, with a decade's uh, delay and, as is often the case, refracted in all sorts of complex and partial uh, ways, which I won't go into here. But I just thought I'd draw your attention to the American kind of uh, centricity of these, uh, of these moments. Uh, of course, you know, it's not completely accidental. Remember, America is the home of cultural anthropology. Uh, and the idea of you know world views being different uh, and requiring respect. What we're talking about here is the realization that anthropology itself is a worldview, has its own culture, uh, stems from a particular cultural perspective. So if you're sensitive to cultural difference, as American cultural anthropology is, it kind of stands to reason that uh, the possibility that you might be sensitive to your own cultural difference. Uh, in the very activity of studying cultural differences as an anthropologist, and that's reflexivity, becomes a live issue for you, right? So uh, I think that's a very crude, perhaps, way of explaining the American-centric um, moment of the crisis of representation in the 1980s, but I don't think it's completely off the mark. So from feminism and, as I say, post-colonialism, as we'll see more next week, to reflexivity. Uh, is the, what I'm looking at this week, uh, this, in this clip, sorry. So the rise of feminist anthropology in the 70s alongside post-colonial studies, as we saw, puts the question of the situatedness of the anthropologist on the agenda, and that's really central to the question of reflexivity. So anthropologists become sensitive to the relation between knowledge and power. Now remember, I mentioned this in passing in a kind of brief slide on Foucault and the Panopticon and so on. This idea that power is central to, uh, sorry, that knowledge is central to uh, power for Foucault. Uh, that's a really important thought here, right? So if you remember, power creates subjectivity for Foucault, and it does so, if you think of the example of the Panopticon, through practices of knowledge. So who gets seen, who knows what others get up to, is a way in which subjectivity is formatted in the prison for Foucault. So knowledge and power are deeply intertwined. And this thought, which is central to Foucault, but runs you know, much more widely in these currents of thinking, uh, is central also to this kind of reflexive turn that anthropology took in the 1980s. Anthropologists become sensitive to the relationship between their own capacity to, as knowers, as product producers of knowledge, and their positionality and situatedness in particular power structures. So the concern of re the, and, and you know unequal power structures, right? Very crudely, if you're coming from say Berkeley in California, 
and you're studying, say, in somewhere in the Philippines, and as we'll see in a moment, actually, I'm not sure that Rosaldo is, well, sorry, sorry, I'm anticipating myself, forget that. You're coming from Berkeley, uh, say, in California, and you're going to study, say, in, I don't know, um, uh, a village in rural India, for example, there's a huge power geopolitical dynamic taking place there, right? This is the kind of inequality in geopolitical dynamics that we're talking about here. And reflexive anthropologists are anthropologists who are sensitive to these differences, how these differences in power also make differences to knowledge, and in this case to anthropological knowledge. So this constant awareness, assessment and reassessment by the researcher of their own contribution, influence and manner of shaping the research and their findings is kind of central idea of reflexivity. Now, this is a methodological move and it's also a political move. Now, those two things go together, but for the sake of the exposition of this clip, I'm going to separate them out and I'm going to give you an example of a kind of methodological point about reflexivity. And then I'll move on to this to the kind of more political questions that are also at the center of it. So methodological reflexivity, I've taken precisely the uh, work of um, the American anthropologist Renato Rosaldo, um, who really underwent a real kind of transformation that can be related to this kind of reflexive uh, turning in the way that anthropologists think. Um, and it's really kind of connecting um, work that he conducted together with his wife, a feminist anthropologist, who I mentioned in an earlier clip, Michelle Rosaldo, in the Philippines, with a group of people who at the time were referred to as Ilongot, who engaged uh, in an activity uh, of really violent um, uh, warfare with neighboring groups, uh, which involved taking heads, uh, head hunting, it's called. Um, so this kind of violent kind of trophy hunting uh, in which um, uh, people engaged uh, at that time uh, when uh, um, the Rosaldos were doing uh, field work with them. Uh, now, I've put this image here from Rosaldo's book from 1989, Grief and the Headhunter's uh, uh, Rage, um, partly because it's so, um, you know, racialized and um, you know, sensationalist, uh, the way in which the, this Ilongot man is being represented as defined by this practice uh, of headhunting, which is so uh, violent and in many ways morally perhaps questionable and repugnant from the point of view of um, a viewer uh, unacquainted with these practices, just looking at this image. So I put it here um, kind of advisedly, and I'm not keen on using these kinds of images without contextualizing them, precisely because it marks the position from which Rosaldo then had to kind of shift uh, in the way that he was depicting um, these practices as an anthropologist, as we'll see in the next slide. So I've got here a long quote from the early book, where basically Rosaldo explains that uh, in his conversations with Ilongot, men who engage in these practices, what those men would highlight is the rage, the anger. Uh, I think the, the, the famous term um, that, uh, in, uh, that, 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 that Rosaldo um, translates here as rage and anger is liget, um, that uh, is associated with this practice. It's anger and grief uh, at losing a person, uh, a fellow Ilongot, in the hands of another group's uh, attack that motivates uh, Ilongot men to go out in an expedition for of to take the heads of their of their foes of their enemies in this way they're motivated by grief and rage and for the there's nothing if you don't understand the kind of way in which the practice and this motivation uh, think of uh, back to Weber's account of the motivation of human action, the action of headhunting and the motivation of rage and grief, the way these three things are wrapped up together, um, you simply cannot understand what this is about. And Rosaldo uh, highlights his own inability to really understand how these things come together for these Ilongot men, and he's kind of puzzled by this practice. And then what happens a number of years later is that um, 
Michel or Shelley, as he called, as she was called, uh, Rosaldo dies actually during fieldwork uh, in the Philippines, and uh, 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 Renato Rosaldo, her husband, himself experiences grief, and indeed the emotions of rage that go with grief uh, when he loses his wife in this um, absolutely um, tragic accident that took place in the Philippines when they were together. And he says that only when this personal experience that happens to him uh, is he begins to become able to relate to and understand what the Ilongot uh, meant when they were talking about Liget uh, and its connection to uh, headhunting, right? So this personal experience, his own kind of positionality as a, as a husband in grief, actually shifts his ability as an anthropologist to understand what his uh, interlocutors in the Philippines uh, are trying to convey to him, right? Or perhaps not trying to convey to him, but themselves are experiencing, right? So this is a kind of methodological argument about reflexivity, which I think kind of conveys some of the central questions when we're looking at this concept. However, while it's kind of bound up with a broader argument about reflexivity in, in the 1980s uh, and the crisis of representation, uh, Rosaldo's argument is fundamentally methodological. Uh, and what I really want to bring home in, the, in this final slide is that the crisis of representation really talks about reflexivity that is not just methodological, but is also uh, has political implications. And that's why it constitutes such a big crisis for the discipline. Um, so political aspect of reflexivity is really what made such a difference to, to anthropology um, from the 1980s onwards. It was provoked, I've mentioned already, a kind of mixture of Marxist sensitivities to geopolitical imbalances, asymmetries and inequalities, a kind of Foucauldian uh, primarily, but also other kind of social theorists that emphasize the relationship between power and knowledge or the centrality of knowledge to regimes of power. Um, so if anthropology is a form of knowledge, it's also a form of power, that, that thought. And the influence of postmodernism, uh, as I mentioned, the questioning, the critical questioning of the certainties of the modern project, uh, of the, the project of modernity as an in inheritor of the project of the Enlightenment uh, that sees kind of human progress as uh, the result uh, of or function of the capacity of human beings through reason and science to understand the world around them uh, in a kind of value-free, neutral, objective, objective, positivistic way, right? The critique of all of that. So mixing all those things together, uh, we have this uh, disciplinary crisis of the 1980s. Um, and really, uh, it comes to a head in these books that I've put up here, uh, there's plenty more, but you know, there's writing culture, which I mentioned earlier, the edited collection, the predicament of culture, anthropology as cultural critique, uh, time and the other is the one that I'm covering by Johannes Fabian uh, in the bottom right corner. Notice the, the dominance uh, of, of the word culture, and that should give you a sense of how, uh, in many ways, American centric these, these books are going to come out of America. Uh, in the 1980s. And central to them is really a, a, a critique of the colonial heritage of anthropology as an intellectual project. To put things very, very simply, perhaps too crudely, using also that, that crude word of uh, the West or Western, which has been quite rightly questioned in, in, in many ways and deconstructed, uh, do Western anthropologists, still predominantly Western at the time of that these books were written, predominantly white, still predominantly male. Look at all the names, uh, James Clifford, uh, George Marcus, <laughs> Johannes Fabian, all white males, um, themselves questioning um, the, uh, the right that they might have, uh, as it were, to depict non-Western others and constitute them as others, right? Is that attempt, isn't that attempt um, of anthropologists to depict um, these others in places like the Philippines that I just talked about, uh, places that have been the re on the receiving end of colonial and, and capitalist geopolitical forces. Um, 
Isn't that part, very part of this geopolitical dominance of the West? Isn't anthropology a conduit of a colonial project of the West? Um, that's the kind of question that lies at the heart. And as I say, post-colonial feminist, radical left-leaning politics in the 60s and 70s lead up to this moment. But the moment of reflexivity really is an injunction not only to realize and raise these questions and acknowledge them, but also to begin to do take steps towards deconstructing and dismounting, if you like, this colonial project um, within anthropology uh, and to begin to think of anthropology um, uh, and its authority, uh, be reflexive about it in order to deconstruct it, contextualize it, shift it. Uh, undermine it, uh, pluralize it in, 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 in whatever way is possible. So a great deal of attention in that moment in the 1980s is played to the form of anthropological writing, hence the culture of, uh, sorry, hence the title of Writing Culture, that book that I mentioned before and that's on the slide, right? The idea here being that part of the constitution of the authority of colonial uh, modern anthropology uh, lies in the way that it gets written. So the authorial voice of such figures as Evans Pritchard or uh, Malinowski or Franz Boas or Clifford Geertz for that matter, um, and the way in which the project is framed in this writing needs to be deconstructed uh, as a literary genre. Um, and for example, the emphasis on the monologue of the anthropologist as a source, a sovereign source of authority in the construction of these anthropological arguments about other people, how people live in Bali or in India or in uh, Pakistan or in, um, um, uh, in the Philippines, uh, in, in Greece and so on. Um, gives way or is meant to give way to a more dialogical or drawing from the Russian uh, critical theorist um, uh, Bakhtin or Voloshinov. Uh, there's a whole uh, identity question about the relation between Bakhtin and Voloshinov, which I won't go into. Heteroglossic, so the different polyglottic voices, the voices of different interlocutors, the voice of the anthropologist entering into dialogue, into tension with those voices, and attempt to reflect all that in the genre of anthropological writing. And this gave rise to a great deal of kind of often postmodern feeling experimentations in anthropological writing in the 1980s and 90s, playful with form, suspicious of grand narratives and attempts to synthesize anthropological knowledge in one coherent whole, which is part of this kind of pretense, as they would see it, of the positivistic project of, of science um, and so on. The idea that no one has a monopoly on the truth, um, and that the inherent relativity, cultural, social uh, relativity of anthropology itself needs to be exposed uh, rather than hidden away, right? Which often leads to a perception of anthropology as a literary rather than just a, a scientific uh, project, right? A shift towards literature and to uh, literary forms um, as an inspiration for doing anthropology is also part of this. So, so much of what we're talking about here is entirely resonant with what's going on, as I said in the first clip, with anthropology today. Uh, and the whole question of decolonization of knowledge really has its roots in these currents that we're, we've been examining in these clips. Uh, I leave it here uh, for this kind of characterization of the moment of the 1980s in order to do as I always do in my final clip, um, to develop some um, critical reflections on this. So I'll see you there.